Good morning, I'm Chris Jansing. 50 votes, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, a passionate advocate for victims of military sexual assault, now has half the Senate behind her bill to take prosecution out of the chain of command. Number 49, Senator Dean Heller joined her at a news conference yesterday. And number 50, the majority leader, Harry Reid, announcing his support shortly after. Gillibrand's bill would turn the investigation over to prosecutors instead of commanders. She is expected to speak on the Senate floor today, and a vote is coming this week. They must create an independent, unbiased military justice system that is deserving of the sacrifice that the men and women in the armed services make every single day. The question of how to prosecute sexual assaults in the military has deeply divided the Senate, pitting Senator Claire McCaskill, a former prosecutor, against Gillibrand. McCaskill is offering her own bill to make changes to the process, but keeping commanders involved. I would be less than candid if I didn't say it has been frustrating to have one policy difference dominate the discussion of this issue over the previous few weeks without anyone even realizing the historic reforms that are contained in this bill. The American people appear to be with Gillibrand, according to the ABC Washington Post poll, 59% supporting independent prosecution. I want to bring in our company, Politico senior congressional reporter Manu Raju, and Molly Ball is the Atlantic's national political reporter. Good morning. Good morning. As you both know, this crosses a party lines. Gillibrand has the support, Molly, of eight Republicans, including uh, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Chuck Grassley. But can she get to 60? Well, that's the question at this point, but she's made so much progress from where she started, and I think you see why a lot of Democrats think very highly of Kirsten Gillibrand, the way she has worked so hard behind the scenes and worked across the aisle to persuade people to support her approach to this. She's refused to give in or, or to compromise with uh, the other approach that was offered, and she's really drawn support from a lot of unexpected quarters. And I think with Senator Reid offering his support now, uh, that's a big deal, and that could potentially move some votes into her column as well. Manu, as you know, not taking sides is the White House. Jay Carney wouldn't say which bill um, the president supports. And considering the Armed Services Chairman Carl Levin and Claire McCaskill are pushing their own plan, what are you seeing? How's this going to play out? I don't think that it's going to pass. I mean, she's going to need 60 votes. Uh, even if she does get 60 votes, which I think is a very high hurdle, uh, getting that through a House-Senate conference committee is extremely, extremely grim, uh, given the opposition from a lot of the defense hawks, uh, from the Pentagon uh, to, their pro to her proposal. Uh, there probably will be some changes to how uh, the military uh, prosecutes these cases and deals with these internally, uh, but I don't think there's going to be taking this outside side of the chain of command, uh, given the staunch opposition uh, from a lot of powerful uh, folks on Capitol Hill and beyond. I want to bring in a Captain Lori Manning, who is director of the Women in Military Project. Sarah Plummer is a former Marine and a military sexual assault survivor. Good morning. Morning. Both of you, as I understand, favor Senator Gillibrand's amendment, taking the power of prosecution out of the chain of command. And you appeared at a presser with her yesterday. Captain Manning, look, we all know the statistics are horrifying. Thousands of sexual assaults every year. Having served in the Navy for more than 25 years, why do you think Senator Gillibrand's approach will help? Uh, I was not only in the Navy, but I was also a commander. I was a, what they call a convening authorities. I, I convened court marshals. Uh, there was a time when it was necessary for COs to be able to do that, but those days are past. We have professional lawyers now. I didn't make medical decisions about my uh, troops, although I had, had responsibilities for them, and I shouldn't be making decisions that require deep legal training either. I think it will serve the uh, overall justice in the military much better to make this change. Sarah, you uh, have a very personal interest in this because you were sexually assaulted while you were in the Marines. And you've talked about the horror of having to tell your story over and over and over again up the chain of command. Uh, tell us what happened, why this is so important to you. Uh, well, I, it's so important to me because I think being able to take some of these cases out of the direct chain of command reduces any additional confusion and uh, impartiality that's, that's there. And all we're really asking for are 
impartial, unbiased, trained legal professionals to be ha handling these cases as best as they can. In fact, one of the ways you've put it, Sarah, is that you've said the military judicial system falls flat on its face in handling assault cases. And I saw once you likened it to getting raped by your brother and having your father decide the case. Tell us what you think it would mean to have an independent military prosecutor. Would it have helped in your case? Well, I think having an independent military prosecutor would, as I said, reduce some of that bias that's just naturally there. I think it's almost uh, unfair for commanders to be placed in the position that they are now to be asked to be the final word on a lot of these cases, to be deciding what goes to trial or not, to be deciding what the final say-so is. And in a way, that's that's putting them in a position that they're really not, not trained for and not ready for, and in fact detracts from good order and discipline, although that's the argument that's being made, to keep it in the chain of command saying that that helps with good order and discipline. I think, on the contrary, it actually threatens good order and discipline for commanders. Captain Manning, take us inside some of these conversations. Have you had opportunities to talk to other members of the Senate, people who are on the other side of this issue? Uh, yes, I have. And uh, I've talked uh, to Senator McCaskill's office. And I, I don't know of anybody that uh, wants things to stay as they are. Senator McCaskill has been a, a wonderful supporter of military women and avidly wants to stop um, sexual assault in the military. Uh, it does distress me when this is portrayed as a, a cat fight. Uh, I like her bill also. Uh, we need everything we can throw at this. Um, and I think everybody is trying their darndest. Uh, but I, most, of, most people making these decisions have not been military convening authorities, and I have. And I'll tell you, I come down on take the felonies away from me. I don't have the training side. I also want to ask you both about this uh, report in Politico today, and I don't know if you saw it, but there was an internal Army email that they had advising Army spokespeople to use uh, less attractive soldiers for marketing purposes. I'm talking about women. And here's a quote from that memo. In general, ugly women are perceived as competent, while pretty women are perceived as having used their looks to get ahead. And then they showed this picture as an example of what they say is a pretty woman undermining the rest of the message. Captain Manning, it, it seems, uh, and maybe I'm, I'm doing a bit of a stretch here, but not long ago there were warnings that women in battle zones wouldn't be able to handle it. They'd, they'd be too emotional. They'd distract their male colleagues. Do you see this kind of thing as a, as a similar misconception? I thought when I saw it, it was something from the military satire uh, website Duffel Blog. I couldn't believe it. Um, a woman's looks, good, bad, or in between, uh, should have nothing to do with who's picked for pictures. Uh, although I've seen the military use good looking men sometimes, particularly the ones that have worked in legislative affairs, to get uh, to, to help them get through some of the people in, in a uh, congressional office when they wanted to talk to the Congress member. So it, it happens the other way around, too. Yeah, Sarah, I, I understand you're, you're not in the military anymore, but do you think it is still hard? Is still more difficult for women? Are, is it still sort of an uphill climb, uh, whether it is something as terrible as sexual assault or just trying to get some parity within the ranks? Well, I think although it's, it is challenging for women, it's not necessarily an impossible uphill climb. Um, I don't think that detracted me from joining. I don't think it detracts many of the women who joined today. We know it's going to be a challenge. That's something you take on uh, knowingly, but you're willing to take on that challenge. Uh, it's you know challenging for men as well. We all have uh, different obstacles we have to face. They're just different nuances for men and women. And just to comment on the Politico art article, I would say, too, that's just a continuation of victim blaming. Whether you're talking about women's looks, what they're wearing, where they are, or whether the bystanders are responsible or not, it's just a continuation of victim blaming, and that's what makes that wrong. Sarah Plummer, Captain Lori Manning, thanks to both of you for being with us.